Thank you very much, Don. Actually, there was a period of, uh, in my life when I'd been a, um, uh, a New York corporate lawyer, a, a uh, New York City and state politician, and an investment banker. I only needed to do real estate, and then I would have been in every sleazy profession that your parents would never mention to their friends that you'd been involved in. Um, but it has been my pleasure over the last few years to be involved in international work, although I loved my time as a lawyer and a banker and a politician. Excellencies, uh, honorees, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm delighted to be here to participate in this, in this forum. Um, it's nice to be with people who want to talk about peace and dialogue and, uh, and, and issues that one wishes more people were concerning themselves with. It's a humbling experience to be here with all of you tonight, and to particularly be here to honor three inspirational colleagues um, and friends. All three of them embodied the true spirit of that century's old me message of inclusion, and all of them have given it a vital modern slant by framing their work in a way that promotes fundamental human rights uh, and dialogue. All three have been fearless in challenging assumptions whether on the rights of women in Islam, on hunger and education, uh, and on human rights generally, to increase the sum of human knowledge and to create a world that is more just, more fair, and more peaceful. By the way, I just want to say, feel free to continue to eat if you're still eating. Uh, again, if I might mention, I, I was the president of the New York City Council. They kept eating all the time when I was presiding over them. So I, I'm going to share with you some of my thinking this evening, but I don't want you to, to leave uh, feeling as though you weren't able to have a good full meal. So a couple words about our honorees. Aziza, who could fail to be impressed by the work your work and the work of your organization, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights, which positions education and dialogue as the best tools to eradicate ignorance, silence, and prejudice. By challenging the myths about the rights afforded to women within Islam, you represent a crystal clear voice of reason to challenge stereotypes and misconceptions. And you do so at a critical moment when understanding is needed more than ever. David, I've been a fan of yours forever, by the way. Your work to keep the issue of hunger high on the agenda is critical. And your leadership in the NGO community as well. As the world finalizes a new set of development goals, Bread for the World and the Alliance to End Hunger, reminds us that more than 800 million people around the world suffer from hunger each and every day. You remind us that no country is immune that hunger haunts even the world's richest country, with almost 50 million Americans struggling to put food on the table. You remind us that the job on hunger is very far from being over. And you strive to build the partnerships across US institutions, Muslim and Jewish groups, corporations, unions, and universities, to build the political will that is what is vital to get the job done once and for all. And Rebecca, your work has been invaluable over the years in pushing the world to go further and to dig deeper on education. And I'll have more to say in a few minutes about you. If you know me, obviously you'll know I have a vested interest in education. Given my role as at, at World Learning and as chair of the Interna I'm presently chair of the International Baccalaureate and as the former chair of the Global Partnership for Education and also my time at UNICEF. But I want to stress the interconnectedness of every part of social development to every aspect of human rights. Education is chained to the achievement of all other human rights, whether it is freedom from hunger, gender equity, or the rolling back of poverty. It is only by understanding the world around us that we have any hope of changing it. And it is, ed it is education that connects us to that world and to each other. We've learned over the past two decades since the adoption of the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, that there is no progress in isolation. No development goal has been reached or indeed will be reached without progress elsewhere. 
Equally, a lack of progress in one area acts as a break on everything else. As a result, we've seen some astounding achievements in some areas over the past two decades, but we also must acknowledge some very deep disappointments. On the plus side, we've seen the halving of the number of people living in extreme poverty at the global level, with around 700 million fewer people living in extreme poverty in 2010 than in 1990. We've seen the halving of the proportion of people without sustainable access to improved sources of drinking water. Five years, actually, before the 2015 deadline. And despite population growth. We've seen impressive progress on preventable diseases with malaria and tuberculosis, in particular, in retreat. And we've seen progress on education, with the number of children out of school falling by almost half. Not quite. The hunger reduction target is almost within our grasp, having the percentage of people who go to bed hungry each night. But, and how wonderful it would be if we could not have to say but. But, as David's work shows us, we still have a long journey ahead on hunger. And when it comes to poverty, we have learned that a rising tide does not, in fact, lift all ships. There are people who are continually sidelined by economic growth. The falling number of children's deaths, child deaths, has revealed child mortality rates that are now concentrated in the poorest regions and in the very first month, not months, but month of life. And we still have almost 800 girls and women dying each and every day during pregnancy and childbirth. That's almost 300,000 each year dying from causes that are preventable. For all the progress on primary school enrollment, we still have about 60 million children out of school, roughly equal to the entire population of Italy. And progress has stalled. We have reached the children who could be pulled into education by providing more schools and more teachers, but there are many others out of school and who will stay out of school for reasons that have nothing to do with the availability of a school. They are the most marginalized children, the poorest of the poor, the children from particular ethnic minorities, children with disabilities, they are girls, and increasingly they are children caught up in war. Indeed, children caught up in war now account for about one quarter of the world's children of primary school age but about half of those out of school are out of school. Children in conflict-affected countries are nearly three times more likely to be out of primary school than children in other low-income countries. And their secondary enrollment rates are nearly one-third lower. These countries, these countries in conflict of war, have some of the largest gender disparities and the lowest literacy levels in the world a very unhealthy and, frankly, a very dangerous situation. Schools themselves are often on the firing line with classrooms, teachers, and pupils seen as legitimate targets. The impact is, as one UN report has put it, and I quote, a growing fear among children to attend school, among teachers to give classes, and among parents to send their children to school. The burdens on the countries affected and on our neighbors are disastrous. I see you have the, 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 the pamphlet on Syria. Take the civil war in Syria. The government of Lebanon has opened the doors of its schools to refugee children from Syria, but simply cannot take them all. There's, there are now some 300,000 refugee children out of school in Lebanon, a number that could top half a million over the next year. Absor Lebanon absorbing all of the children that have come over from Syria would be the equivalent of New York absorbing the entire school populations of Washington, D.C., and Chicago. Perhaps it is not surprising, given such massive waste of human capital, that no fragile or conflict-affected country, meaning war, has yet achieved a single Millennium Development Goal. We know that what happens in school matters, that education can work for our collective peace and security, 
but we also know it can work against it. It can incubate or it can mitigate. That is the power it holds over our future prospects. We know that a good quality education is crucial for the creation of cohesive, peaceful, and prosperous societies and for our collective future security, for nation building, and for tolerance, and for the achievement of a whole range of rights, such as poverty reduction, good health, proper nutrition, and social protection. We know that a good quality education helps children and youth to make good choices for themselves and their communities. They learn that conflict, a natural part of life, need not escalate into violence. We know, as Rebecca's work has highlighted over the years, that education quality and quantity are inseparable. It is quality that lures children in the classrooms and keeps them there. And it is the quality of education that paves the way for a more secure and prosperous future. And getting children into the classroom is in itself of great value. Rebecca's research on madrasas in Pakistan suggests that contrary to most assumptions, they can help to prevent the recruitment of young men into extremist groups. Further proof of the sheer power of education. There are signs of a renewed determination to address this issue, including uh, a strengthened uh, global partnership for education, I'm happy to say. Uh, the UN Secretary General's Global Education First, as occasionally weak as it is, and the education cannot wait call for action. No, indeed, the point is you cannot put children on pause. Children cannot wait for war to end. On average, the conflicts in low-income countries from 1999 to 2008 lasted 12 years on average. That's longer than most children in these countries would typically attend school. So we must position education front and center as a crucial part of peace building and state building, as an effective way to help countries heal their wounds and to prevent violence in the future. We need, above all, to play the long game. <laughs> this is not rocket science. rocket science. We know all of this. But there is still a gap between knowledge and action. Policymakers today are struggling with dozens, if not hundreds, of competing demands. The response to climate change, for example, the continuing fallout of recent economic and financial collapses, inequality of opportunity, and the wake of that inequality, growing social discontent. They need to understand that increasing the school enrollment rate by at least 10%, 10% reduces the likelihood of a country experiencing conflict by 3%, and the length of conflicts fall as male enrollment rates increase. Governments need to break out of their comfort zones and break down their own traditional slices. They need to move from a silo approach to a partnership approach. In this interconnected world, development is everybody's business, not just the business of ministries of education or health or social welfare. And governments themselves are no longer the only players in town. There are new kids on the block, a private sector whose investments for, uh, far exceed official development assistance and need to come on board, as David's work has shown. New donors are emerging from what we once called the developing world, and who work in partnership across the global south. A geographic shift in development away from the traditional western dominance of the development business. There is an even stronger civil society that is increasingly important in shaping local solutions. And above all, there are people, millions upon millions of them, who are themselves interconnected and governments are starting to realize that if they do not act, people will get on with it themselves, increasingly skirting around traditional politics to create their own movements, their own responses. People are speaking out as never before. There were six billion mobile phone subscriptions in developing countries in 2012. And people are using their new technology to make themselves heard with 500 million tweets every day last year. People are increasingly vocal. Between 2006 and 2013, 37 protests 
topped one million participants. From around one million people protesting against corruption and inequality in Brazil, to 100 million protesting about the quality of life in India. The key word here is dialogue. Governments, civil society, businesses and citizens talking to, and even more importantly, listening to each other. True dialogue may mean communicating with those who have, have a very different mindset. I know from my own experience at UNICEF how difficult it is to build genuine dialogue with those who skew education for ideological ends. The Taliban in Afghanistan, for example, or Al-Shabaab in Somalia. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, especially when such groups control and even deliver local services. We need to be as fearless as those we are honoring tonight and as fearless as a young Pakistani girl who was prepared to put her own life on the line in her pursuit of education. If a young girl can do that, the least we can do is speak out loud and clear about the need for education as the foundation for peaceful and tolerant societies. The least we can do is to nurture a new, genuine and global dialogue on the kind of global society we want. A world that ends the scourges of poverty, of hunger, of ignorance, and rights violations. Dialogue is by its very nature humble. Dialogue means switching off the ego and understanding that no single person has all the answers. So may I end with a quote from the man who 700 years ago provided the inspiration for the Rumi Foundation and who has, in his own way, brought all of us here this evening. And I quote, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. Cleverness is mere opinion. Bewilderment, intuition. Thank you very much.